Well, good morning, church. It is so good to see everybody here today. I'm thankful that we braved a little bit of cold weather and uh, came out to just praise the Lord. And I'm really excited to do that. So as we prepare our hearts to do so, will you stand as we just open our hearts this morning. Whatever we may have going on in our lives, it's so beautiful a reminder that we can come to this place together and just fulfill our ultimate purpose of giving God the honor and glory that he deserves. I believe you 
Welcome to church. We're glad you're here today. It's a cold one out there, but it's warm in here. That's awesome. Uh, we have a lot going on this month, and uh, it's exciting. Uh, and just almost every Sunday, we've got something going on other than church, of course, right? So we have Megan's baby shower today, and uh, so that's awesome. Megan, congratulations coming. Going to be very soon. Uh, next week, we have uh, Sarah. We'll be sharing a little bit about something that's going on next week uh, after church. And then the week after that, Haley, uh, I started to say Ludwig, but it's not Ludwig anymore. And Eric got married uh, not just a few weeks ago, and we're going to have a shower for them. Uh, and then uh, it's, just, it's just a lot going on. <laughs> so Brendan has got a, a wedding shower coming up. Uh, so we've got a lot of good things happening in our church that we get to celebrate together and support and be a part of, and we're, we're glad to be able to do that. Um, let's, let's pray together this morning. It's awesome to be here today. Most Holy God, we just want to thank you so much for loving us, and uh, I, I just love the messages of these songs, Lord, and as, as we just sang the song about you being steadfast, and God, I, I know in my life, and I know that in, in everybody's life that's here, it seems like sometimes our lives are just all over the place, you know, things that there are changes and things that are constantly moving and insecurity and, and all these things that, that happen in our lives. And, and Lord, I, I'm just so thankful that, that you are a rock that we can stand on. And so many times in your word, you just describe yourself exactly as that, as a solid foundation. And God, I'm, I'm thankful that, that, that we have you, that you don't change, that you are always there, that you are consistent and that you love us, and that never changes. Even though we may, may drift or, or come and go and, and be hot and cold in our relationship with you, you are steadfast with us always. And God, thank you for that. It's so awesome to have that in our lives. We're here to worship you today because you are so awesome. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Oh, 
Thanks for coming to church today. Uh, children can be dismissed for Children's Church, too. All right. So we're going to be doing something a little different today. Uh, as Doug mentioned last week, if you were here, we're not going to be doing a typical sermon. I'm going to be going over something a little um, different, just going over. It's the history and the reliability of the Bible. So I use Doug's old thing because I'm not good at making my own, and this kind of works still. So they're going to be doing the literal story of the Bible, mostly the New Testament today because uh, I was thinking about it, and I was talking to Bryant too. We're going to have to have a part two because um, this would take a lot more than the two hours I'm going to take of your time this morning. I'm just kidding. 30 minutes of your time this morning. <laughs> he didn't cook, so I had to cut it short. But <laughs> all right, so... 
I, I wanted to start off by explaining to everybody a couple things. One, why is this important? Uh, th- this is something that a lot of people probably look past. They don't think about much. And why is this important is something I want to go over. And then I wanted to give you the most common argument I have heard for why the Bible is reliable and true. And it is also one of the worst arguments for why the Bible is historical, true, and reliable. First off, the Bible is under attack today a lot. If you go into college, if you go to you know, somewhere that's not filled with Christians, you're going to find the Bible is not looked upon very highly often. It's looked down upon. People think it's not very reliable. They think it's a pretty poor book. They think it's some evil stuff. They typically point to passages out of context and say, well, if, even if he is real, I don't want to worship that God, all these different things. Um, everybody knows when you go to university, uh, a lot of people start off going in as a Christian and then leave non-Christian. And so the Bible is under attack today more than ever. Now, I heard a guy, James White, he had actually uh, said this in a, not, not a debate, but a talk he gave on this, where he said 50 years ago, nobody thought about this. You could have a, an atheist, you could have somebody from a different religion, or any Christian, and they would have agreed, yes, the Bible's reliable. A, a, almost everybody in America would have agreed with that. They might have differed in what exactly they meant, but that was a general standpoint. Whereas today, that is not a general standpoint between a lot of people. They might pick a few passages and say those are reliable because they push forward what they want, but the whole Bible as a, as a book together is not looked upon the same way as it once was. And so, just to get you guys thinking, you may not struggle with this. You might not even think about it. You might trust the Bible wholly, completely, never thinking about it once in your life. But you have friends, you have kids, grandkids, you have people that you're going to meet, and then you could struggle with this in the future, right? So I want you guys to remember as you're listening to this, which is boring to most people but interesting to me, this is important because you're going to have a part of your life where you're struggling with this or where family and friends are struggling with this. And if you have no idea what to say, that's a problem. And, and Peter, Peter tells us in one of his writings that we're supposed to always have, and this is a paraphrase, I don't have it off the top of my head, we're supposed to know and always have a reason for why we believe these things. So that's what I'm going to try and do today. And I'm going to start, like I said, with the worst argument. And I don't have any slides, I don't think, for this. But the worst argument I've ever heard, somebody says to you, why do you think the Bible is reliable? Why, why do you think it's God's word? And they go, because it tells me it is. And then they go to 2 Timothy. I actually do have this one. 2 Timothy 3.16. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. And now, two things can be true at once. That is 100% a true statement. And the second thing is, that will convince nobody who's not already convinced. If somebody asks you, why do you believe a certain way, and you said, because I do, they're not going to switch sides. Let's put it that way. And so, I've heard this argument a lot. I have given it as uh, I was a younger Christian several times, and it is, it, I wanted to just start off with, this is not what I'm going to tell you this morning. I'm not going to tell you the Bible's God's word because it tells me it's God's word. It does tell me it's God's word. That's not a good argument. Let's put it that way. And so, with that being said, I wanted, we, we can go on to my, the, the main point. I'm not going to have a bunch of these main point slides in here, but how did we get the scriptures and are they accurate? That's the, that's the summary question I'm going to try and answer today. And like I said, I'm going to start in the New Testament, and then we'll have to maybe do a part two if Doug wants to hear this again. Um, but we're, we're going to talk about that and get an understanding of where they came from, how they were translated all the way up, and it's going to be very uh, condensed. So if you have any questions, feel free to ask. But I wanted to, if you can bring up the next slide... That is Greek, if you guys didn't know. The entire New Testament was written in a different language than English. The Apostle Paul did not have the King James Bible in his lap when he was going church to church and talking. And so, uh, as I'm learning Greek, I just was going to read this real quick, and I want you guys to guess what verse this is. It's a very famous verse. And so, what this is saying is, Utos gar agapison ha theos ton kosmon oste ton huion Ton manogene edokin ina pas ha pestuen es alton me apolitai al eke zoe ionian. And so 
I know we have Eric might know it, but um, if you guys, this is foreign language. I wanted, I wanted to put this up here. This is actually John 3.16. I wanted to put this up here to let you guys realize we don't find manuscripts of the English Bible in Israel or in Rome or anywhere in the world. So when we are looking to find out, hey, has this been changed over time? Has this gone through a bunch of revisions? Has there been people who have added, you know, hey, nobody thought Jesus was God, but we're going to put this in here so people start to think that. We have to know, we have to have people, and I can't do this, don't get the wrong idea, I'm far from this. We have to have people who can not only read Greek, but if you can go to our next slide, Kim, they have to be able to read Greek on manuscripts. And so I wanted to bring up a couple pictures of different manuscripts so you guys can understand when these archaeologists and scholars, when they're looking at these things, they're not looking at a nice printed Bible. You know, this is a Greek one, but they're not looking at this nice Bible where they go, oh, that's what it says. No, they're looking at tiny fragments of these documents in papyrus. Papyrus is just a paper they used back in the day, pretty much. And so this is a, I just wanted to show you a couple of these manuscripts so you can maybe get an appreciation for how hard of a job this is to do. This is not something that most people can do. Very few people can do this. So this is known as P52. That means Papyrus 52, the 52nd one that they've cataloged. This is the oldest manuscript that we have of the New Testament. And so if you guys didn't know, the New Testament was written in the early first century. So we, some people will go as low as like 55 AD for some first books, all the way up to in the hundreds AD. And that's a long period of time, but the books are spread across that time. This is one of the best pieces of evidence we have. And it's small, so it's not going to stand and they'll make the whole Bible re- reliable by itself. But this is made, we approximately have 90 AD is the most, the earliest estimate up to 150 AD is when this was fe- written. I want you to realize this is the first, th- these manuscripts are going to be the first big thing that we can look at to say, wow, this is reliable. If you talk to professors at, and, and colleges and you'll hear people like, uh, there's a guy, Bart Ehrman, who is a famous New, Textual, New Testament critic and, you know, he deconverted from the faith, all this stuff. They'll say, we don't know what we had in the first century. Things like this are how we can say we do know that. This 90 AD say that's the earliest they give, let's say that's right. That's right when the last book of the Bible was being written, for most people guess, Revelation. This is huge, because we actually have documents from right near that time and going on. If you go to the next one, this is another manuscript, P90. Second century, so from, there's a wide range of estimates, because what they do is they look at the handwriting to see you know, where does this line up with other things we have that are dated? And so they look at the handwriting, which that's pretty hard to read, obviously. So you have to really know what you're doing and know the language well. But this is from about the second century. It's the Gospels. The first one was a part of John. This one is, again, most of these early ones, we only have a small amount from right around that time just because of how long it's been. Um, I've heard the joke by one of these guys, if you they say, like, well, these didn't wear, you know, last that well. And he said, well, you try living 2,000 years and tell me how you look after that. So that's similar to what happened here. These things just get beat up. They get torn up, bugs, things destroy them over time. If you go to the next one, what happened for a long time was Christianity was not a legal religion. And so you had people persecuting those Christians. They were trying to destroy the writings that they had. What's an easy way to destroy the religion is take away everything that they believe in. And if you don't have the writings, we don't really know what we believe in, do we? So this is one of the first ones that was written. This is GAO3, Codex Vaticanus. This is one of the first that's done, like I said up there, by a professional scribe. So the ones beforehand were done by people who could write and read, but they were scared for their life because they're being persecuted oftentimes. And they aren't given, you know, an academic setting to do this in. And throughout all of that, they're just trying to get it written down so that other Christians can have the Bible or parts of it. We don't realize today that back in those days, they didn't have a 66-book Bible 
wherever they went. They couldn't go to Walmart and get one. They couldn't go to Amazon and order one. They didn't have the Bible at all. In the beginning of Christianity, they had the apostles who wrote this stuff or who worked with people to get it written, in the case of like Luke. And so they didn't have all that, and they were trying to copy this down so more people could get the letters from Paul and Peter and the Gospels and all that. This is right about when the church was legalized. It was finally made the state religion, and they could get professional scribes with the best equipment and all of these things to write it down. So that's why this one, this is handwritten, if you guys, it's not typed back then. This is handwritten, and this is about in the 4th century, early 4th century. That looks a lot better than what we have. This is a really important document as well because this is one of the largest ones we have. Is that you see 142 parchment leaves. That means a parchment leaf is like one, one flap of the paper. So the front and back of each one. So 142 of them. This is a pretty big document that we have and it's really helpful to know what, you know, we can trace it back a little bit between other manuscripts as well. It's really helpful to have this one. But this lead, led me to the question as I was studying this stuff, why don't we have the originals? Um, if Doug writes a sermon, um, I don't want to hear Eric and Matt and Jim's rendition of the sermon passed on. I would rather hear Doug's original rendition. But we don't have the original. So there are a couple of questions of why don't we have them? And then as we get through the rest of this, I'll explain why we can be sure we have the original writings, just not the original papers it was written on, the original ideas. D uh, there's a guy, Dan Wallace, he's a huge guy in this field. Um, by most people's standards, he's had a very boring life looking at papers from ancient Greece and Israel and all that, but he's done so much for Christians today to be able to understand the Bible is reliable. Dan Wallace, he, he has a good point. If you have an original document written by the apostles and people think it's scripture, it's going to be copied again and again and again and again and again and again and read again and again and again and again and again. Look at an old Bible. Again, paper does not hold up like that. So Dan Wallace, I agree with him. He says that these old documents, they were copied and stuff so many times, they probably have been disintegrated for a long period of time. And that's okay. Again, we'll get on to why that's not, shouldn't ruin your faith in the Bible and why that's not Scripture. But common sense would tell us that these papers are probably disintegrated by how much use they had. So, how do we know this is reliable, then, if we don't have those? Well, we have 5,500 plus, so 5,500 plus manuscripts of the New Testament. A manuscript is just those things I've shown you. It's any find with some of the New Testament on it, whether good or bad. There are times where we found stuff, and we've been like, man, this guy added a lot. There's actually a manuscript where he had commentary on everything in the Bible, too, in the lines of Scripture. So, Instead of saying Peter got out of prison when the angel let him out, it actually says Peter got out of prison and then took X amount of steps until he looked up, looked left. These are things that we know. We can read all the manuscripts and go, that's a lot of extra stuff added to it. But we have 55 plus, 5,500 plus manuscripts of the Greek New Testament alone. And then we have thousands of other languages where it was a translation into that language. Latin, Syriac, Coptic, these different languages that are ancient. And like I said, you get these really nice handwritings, but if you can go to the next one, some people write like me, and they see these manuscripts, and they like, oh my gosh, I can't read any of this. And so when you get people who write like me, I don't spell everything correctly sometimes. I always got in trouble at school. I don't know. I might have gotten better at it. I always got in trouble at school because when I was writing, suddenly it goes straight, and then towards the end it would just into the other lines, into the other... So as people are copying these things, when we have all these manuscripts, you have to realize people did what I did. There were some people who said, okay, we need copies of this, we need to do this, we're gonna, I, I'm going to do it. Even though I'm not the best at this or I'm not good at this, I'm going to do it. And so in these manuscripts, we find something called variants. Variants are just little differences that we found in those manuscripts. And we'll get into that more in a little bit. But what I wanted to make sure that we knew is across these many, many, many thousands of manuscripts we have, 
there are no major issues that change doctrines essential to being a Christian. So you'll get a lot of people who will tell you, if you learn the original languages and you read this stuff, which you don't have to do, it's, it's a lot of work and it's hard, if you learn these things, you will realize, oh my gosh, everything's different. In uh, Bart Ehrman's book, Misquoting Jesus, he talks about this. He says, there are so many differences in, in, in these writings, it's just, we have no idea what the originals say. But if you read the end, where he's asked questions in an appendix, they ask him, how many doctrines have been changed by this? And he says, none. That's a bit deceiving if you're just reading the main part of the book and you say, oh my gosh, we don't know what the originals are. But then at the very end, he says, there's nothing changed. We, I, I want to give just a, a little bit of an example of this as well. But before I go, let, let me make this real quick. The vast majority of these differences, I believe it was 99, 98% are punctuation, spelling, because some people like me don't know how to spell or punctuate, let's be honest. It's punctuation, spelling, and word order. If you didn't know Greek, you can put the word order in any way and it mean the exact same thing. So in English, if I say, I love Jordan, my wife, that's the only way I can really say that and have everybody make sense of it. In Greek, you could say, Blake, Jordan, love. I, Jordan, Blake. I love, you could say so many things, as long as you have all the words there, it still can me means the same thing. So that's a big portion of the difference if somebody switches those word orders around, probably due to their main language that they held. So a lot of people spoke Greek as a secondary language. But I wanted to give an example of this. If you can go to the next slide. So up on the left there is called the New World Translation. There's a group of people calling themselves Christians. They are Jehovah's Witnesses, is what you, most people know who they are. They, are, they don't think Jesus is God. They have a lot of differences in normal Christianity, all these different things. They have their own Bible translation too. So on the left there is their Bible translation, and you can see the highlighted part. Most of us know John 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. You can see on the right, the New American Standard, the English Standard, the NIV, the, all these major translations people use today say the Word was God. If you talk to Jehovah's Witness, they will say the Word was a God. Now, this is one of the reasons this is important to know. If you had a Jehovah's Witness come to your door and ask you what, if you're a Christian, you say yes, and they go, did you know that the Bible doesn't say that Jesus was God? That's corrupted. They would say that the Catholic Church and different Protestants corrupted it over time. What would you say to them? Just think about how you would respond to that. Because what if your kids are in the next door of this room listening and they get oh my gosh, I can't trust any of this stuff anymore. Again, this might not matter to you, but this is important because it matters to other people. The statistics about people leaving the church is crazy. And stuff like this is a lot of the reason. Good news is, when you learn Greek, like a lot of these professors and scholars have, you can read the Greek manuscripts and find out this is bogus. There's not a single manuscript in the New Testament that has a God instead. So if you can go to the next picture. So this is from the Tyndale Greek New Testament. It's just a Tyndale made a New Testament of the earliest manuscripts that we have in Greek. This is John 1.1 1, 1 as well. So it says, in arche, in hoth logos, kai hoth logos, in pros ton theon, kai theos, in logos. I know you can't read that, but I wanted to put it up there for you know, reliability's sake, if somebody can, they can't say, ah, you liar. There's no A in there. There's no word for a God. Logos is word, so in the beginning was the word. Theos is God, and Theon is God. When in Greek, they have different endings for different ways of saying things. That is not in there anywhere else. This is the reading we find in every single manuscript we have of First John, or of John 1. Every single one. I've met with a Jehovah's Witness, and I asked him about that, and he didn't have an answer. The reason I bring that up is because we need to know at least something, or someone who can help, so that when people come to us, not just Jehovah's Witnesses, but atheists, non-Christians of any kind, Muslims do this a lot, and they say these things, we need to understand how to respond. Because we also, we, not only do we want to know the truth, do we want our kids and our friends and our family to know the truth, we want them to know the truth. We should love our 
friends, our family. We should love our enemies, and we should love those outside of the church as well, right? It's a loving thing to learn these things, to talk to people about it. So I want to move, move now a little bit into how did we get the, or I'm sorry, wrong side. I want to move now a little bit into just looking at, you know, what are these differences a little bit more? And, and last Sunday I said there's hundreds of thousands of differences in these manuscripts, which sounds scary initially, but again, it is punctuation, spelling, word order, and all these things. There are differences, though, that are not punctuation, they're not spelling, and they're not word order differences. They're differences in what we have. One person said it this way, another person said it this way. One person used this word, one person used this word. So, what does that mean? Like, you know, are, are, are there spots in there that tell us that Jesus is God or not God? We, no, there's not. But as we look at that, out of all of those hundreds of thousands of differences, I don't know, I don't have the math off the top of my head, but they did some math. Uh, people, uh, Daniel Wallace has a, a group that he works with. I believe he did this math. Less than 1% of them are substantial and viable. What that means, substantial means more than spelling or punctuation, more than something small that doesn't make a difference. Somebody forgot something. And viable means we actually have a reason to think this could be original. This could be like what the apostles wrote, right? Because, again, there are people who add things in. We know that. It's in, we, we see it in, there's different versions of the Greek New Testament. There's the Texas Receptus, which is the King James, New King James. That has things that are, we can logically deduce from study of this that have been added. Nothing bad, but things that have been added to elaborate compared to, like, what we have the critical text, which is what most of our Bibles are based off of today. The critical text is, we found all these extra manuscripts. We're going to study them hard and deeply and take a lot of time to find out which one makes sense to be the most original, closest to the beginning. I wanted to look at the two largest examples, because there's two big ones that most people don't know about. But I've had a lot of people, they read like the King James Bible, and they said, oh my gosh, the new Bible translations, they're taking scripture out. They're hiding things. And so I wanted to look at them to give you guys confidence that they're not hiding things and why they actually put these things in. So if you can go to the next slide. So this is Mark 16.8. If you read like an NIV, ESV, New American Standard, all these different ones. Trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. And then if you can go to the next slide. This is what most of your Bibles will say if you're reading something outside of the New King James or the King James. If you look at the top there, it says, the earliest manuscripts and some other ancient witnesses do not have verses 9 through 20. So people will come, out, come talk to you a lot and say, see, your Bi- you don't even know what you have in your Bible. That's not true. We're not going to look at every you know, single verse in this and explain how it doesn't change doctrine. Go home and read it. This does not change anything Christians believe today. Doesn't te- th- this isn't the only verse that we have teaching us about Jesus. This isn't the only verse we have talking about faith and what happened after the stuff. We have other verses telling us, go into the world, preach. This doesn't change our faith. So, when people claim it does, you can say, what part of my faith changes with this? And you can explain to them it doesn't. In the earliest manuscripts, though, we don't find this verse. There are these sections, 9 through 20. This is the largest section that we don't find in the early manuscripts. These early copies that we found of the writings. We have so much scripture, this many verses, I'm surprised it's this little, to be honest. If you think about humans, you would have think of it a bit more. And then there's one more after that. It, um, th- if you go to the next one, the next one that we have is John seven fifty three through eight eleven, and uh, a lot of people say this is their fa- one of their favorite stories about Jesus, and we'll see the same thing. In the earliest manuscripts, other ancient witnesses do not have this part, and it says a few have this, a few have that, but this is the story of the woman caught in adultery, where the woman's brought up and Jesus, you know pretty much says, hey, cast, if whoever hasn't sinned, cast first stone, all that stuff. And so 
when you look at this, they still have it in there, most of them. But when we look at the earliest manuscripts, most of them don't have this. I say again, read this. I won't read it now, but read it. This changes none of our beliefs. Absolutely zero things change by this. It can make you feel weird that we have things like this happening, but I want to make sure we know two things. One, I would rather you hear it from a church than from some atheist professor who sounds smart, says, hey, this isn't in the originals, but you have it in yours. What are you going to do about that? I'd rather you hear that from us and realize this doesn't change our faith than hear it from somebody else and maybe leave your faith because you don't know where to look, you're nervous about this, all these different things. Just because the earliest ones don't have this and doesn't have the other one, there's some people who say it's still original. The part, we, we, we don't really know. There's, a, there's good evidence on both sides. The evidence seems to lean towards they're not in the originals. We need to know this stuff so that when you're hit by somebody who does know this stuff but isn't a Christian, you're not shaken and driven, driven away. If you're convinced these are original and you think, man, you're nuts, Blake, and these other people who are doing it, I don't care what they say, that's fine. Keep it in there. That's totally fine. Again, it doesn't change your faith. So if somebody, I'm, I'm talking to somebody and I tell them that and they say, you're a terrible, no good person. I'm keeping these in there. I say, okay. It doesn't change anything good or bad. It doesn't make you do more. It doesn't make you do less. It's the same message of the overall Bible. I want people to understand that there are differences as we go through time. The differences are not substantial. They're not going to change things. Again, I want to really hammer that into your head. When we see things like this, though, it, lead, it led me to question, I think it leads most people to question, if we don't have the originals or a single manuscript, how can we know the original was preserved? And so if you can go into the next slide, Two things can be true. 50% or 75% is not what we have. I like, I, I believe James White again brought this one up. The more likely situation is we have 110% and we need to get back to 100. So we have the originals. We need to go and find the Mark and the John and go back to that 100%. That's a much better way of looking at this. So when you're reading the Bible, remember, you have the apostles' words. You have the word of God in your hands, and you can be sure of that. And then we weed out the rest, but the rest that we're talking about, again, is not substantial. It's nothing going to change what you're believing. If you can go to the next slide. I wanted to give you guys a comparison. So we believe, so we read these old documents and we believe what they say. We believe the history about them. We read uh, these different older writings like Plato and all that. And we aren't really like, man, I wonder if he actually said this. But when it comes to the Bible, we do that. This is something from uh, the Institute of New Textual, Testament Textual Research. If you look at this, this is a lot of words and numbers. But what it's saying is, this is the work on the left. The earliest manuscripts we found of that work, how many years, the gap of time is how many years from when they wrote it, or when we believe they wrote it, to the first manuscript being found, and then the total number of manuscripts. You can see the New Testament at the bottom, the earliest manuscript, 125 AD, that's at P52. They kind of put it in the middle of the 90 and the 150. 30 year difference from when we originally wrote it, which is 90 AD. It could be from that, around that time as well. We, we, there's more research needs to be done on that. We have a total of 5,856 approximate manuscripts. All of these other things that we take is accurate. The most we have is Homer's Iliad at 1,900 manuscripts. And that was 400 years from when he wrote it. Feel free to look at this. It's a, it should be in the uh, weekly update. I want you to realize that we trust all these other documents, and nobody questions it. But when it comes to the Bible, suddenly you have people who go, oh, we can't trust anything. You have to understand, people, this is a theological problem. They're not coming after the New Testament because they think it's inaccurate and they just want to come to the truth. Most of these people do not like God. Not everybody. Most people don't like Christians. They don't like God and they want to tear down that message. 
And this is evidence of that. Nobody comes up and says, ah, Homer's Iliad, you can throw it away. We don't even know what it said. Nobody says that. But they say that about the Bible for obvious reasons. If you can go to the next slide. The Greek New Testament manuscripts by century, second century, so that's right after 100 AD and up, we have 12. Doesn't sound like a ton, but that's the most we have of any document we've ever found that early. 61 in the third, 121, all the way up to just before 1000 AD, 967. Within 900 years of the average classical author, so classical just means ancient author pretty much, we have no manuscripts, but we trust them. Again, this isn't a problem with do we know if the Bible is reliable. This is a problem with do I like what the Bible says and do I want it to be reliable? I argue you should see it as reliable whether you like it or not, because it is. The, all the evidence seems to point that way. If you can go to the next, next one too, Kim, a lot of people will say if we don't have the original and we have all of these manuscripts, different differences in them and whatnot, how do we know it's true? I like what James White said. This is actually from a debate he had with Bart Ehrman. I like what he said. He said, ironically, that idea of a single perfect, perfectly preserved version is indeed a very popular concept amongst Muslims. This is, in fact, their view of the Quran, because, but it has never been the view of an informed Christian. There are Christians who have the Second Timothy argument. He's talking about Christians who have looked into this and studied this deeply. In fact, the Islamic assertion of a single preserved version leads to the inevitable questioning of those who produced it. Uthman, the third caliph, who burned the sources he used. If, if you, before you go to the next one, I want to say, what he's saying there is if you have one source... And that's it. You don't have a bunch of sources spread across somewhere. You have one source. People are going to say, well, of course you corrupted it. It's the only source you have. If, if I, not even me, I won't, I won't do that. If, if, if Apostle Paul came up here today somehow, and he had the book, and he was the only one who had the book, I would question it a little bit more, wouldn't you? Wouldn't, I mean, if one person does it, it's a little different compared to thousands of people spread across an area and then they all suddenly have the same message. If you're playing the telephone game, it's hard to find out at the end of the line who's messed it up. But if you have five telephone games coming at once, you can listen to all five and go, oh, I think this is what they were saying. You can gather the good from all five, what's similar, what, what, what they all have in common, and then get to the original. So if you go to the next slide, that's kind of what happened with Christianity. If preservation is not to be found in a single manuscript with no variance, how then has it been preserved? It has been preserved through the very mechanism that produced the majority of textual variants. So those are the differences that we see. The rapid, when you have scripture and you have one copy, you're going to copy it rapidly, a lot, repeatedly. Uncontrolled, what he means by that is we had people copying it in Rome and then in Ephesus and then in Israel, different places, and then in Alexandria, which is in Egypt. We had people copying the same stuff all over the empire of Rome. And they didn't have phones and copy machines. So you know what they did? They copied it to the best of their ability. And the same people in Rome did the same. And Ephesus did the same. And Corinth did the same. And then, you see, he says, the widespread explosion of manuscripts during the early centuries in the Christian era shows this. We're not going to look at it. He has a graphic. We're not going to look at it at the end of that. But what he's saying is, when we read a copy of the Gospel of Mark in Rome, that we found in Rome, and then we read one that we found in Alexandria, we can see they line up very well. And back in those times, the guy in Rome couldn't call the guy in Alexandria and said, hey, did you change verse 4? Oh, I'm going to change verse 4 too. It's not corrupted because so many different groups with different beliefs and different, you know, like we have denominations today, they had those groups back then too. These different groups were all writing it in different places, and we look at them all and we're like, wow, these are almost exactly the same. That shows us these people weren't corrupting it. And when they did corrupt it, it shows us, oh wow, I can see that. It's like a sore thumb. Because out of the ten we have, only one of them says that. So we can look at the other nine and go, well clearly that wasn't in there. The tenth guy must have added it or messed up. There's one example where instead of reading up to down and then up to down, there's a scribe who read right to left, or left to right. Well, if you're trying to copy something that starts here and goes down, and you start copying left to right, you're going to get different readings because you're reading it incorrectly. 
We can see that, though, because the vast majority did it right. We, we see this in all the manuscripts where there's differences, like I said, in spelling and grammar, but nothing else for the most part. We can also look at throughout time. We can read a manuscript. If you guys, this is Old Testament. We have the Dead Sea Scrolls. This happened just recently in the last century with the Dead Sea Scrolls. We had the Old Testament. People said, we don't know what it actually said. It's not original. And the earliest manuscript we had is from 900 A.D., thousands of years after it was written. Well, we found the Dead Sea Scrolls, which are dated to like 200 B.C., so long time before that, and they matched almost exactly. We can do that with the New Testament, too. We can look at manuscripts from 1,000 A.D. Some monk in a monastery was writing it down. And then we can compare it to the stuff we found in the first century, and they match. It shows us that this is reliable and that God has preserved his word in the copies. We don't have to worry about that. We can also, I don't have any slides for this, but we can look at people outside of Christians and find out this stuff's reliable too. There's a guy, Josephus, who we get a lot of our history from. And Josephus, he is not a Christian. He's a Jew writing for Rome. And he writes about this sect following Christ. And he writes about how these, he calls them heretics because he's a Jew and he's not a Christian. But he says these, these people who are worshiping Jesus as a Messiah. He's not a Christian. He's not arguing for Christianity. He's just saying these things were happening and they were real at this time. And we have other writings. We have Roman records and different things that uh, support this as well. And so I, I hope so far you've seen there are these differences. They're not substantial. We can get the original by looking at all these copies and having people study it and people who know the original languages, all that stuff. Sometimes it's not as... I wanted to lay the groundwork before I get to this next part. And, and if you just go to the next slide. With all that being said we can confidently say the New Testament is reliable beyond doubt and is trustworthy. If we trust all these other documents, we should trust the New Testament. You don't even have to be a Christian to agree with that. We trust all these other things. We can trust this document because of the evidence it has backing it. Just like we trust other documents with far less evidence. And I appreciate you bearing with me. That... For a lot of people, that is hard, you know, it's deeper, boring stuff that they don't want to listen to. But again, remember this and at least know somebody who you can point someone to. Because this is the kind of stuff driving people away from Christianity. They think we're a bunch of fools who read the Bible and just ignore everything else. Christians don't do that. This is important to know so that you can tell people why it's true. I also want to get in, you know, and now that was kind of the, it wasn't as much of a sermon like normal, but the next part I'm going to make it more, more normal. So hopefully that can uh, maybe draw you back in. In the scripture we see, they're reliable, so we've, we've got that done. In the Bible, we see people saying, Jesus rose from the dead. So this is a reliable document, we've established that. And the people in this document are claiming that Jesus rose from the dead and that he is God. So, if somebody asks you, I wanted to, well, let me read this real quick. Go, if you can go to the next slide, 1 Corinthians. So it says, and if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless. And so is your faith. More than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God. For we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead, but he did not raise him if, in fact, the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised, uh, raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then those who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. And he's saying hell there. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. So I want to go to the next slide. We're going to speed it up a little bit. Why should you be a Christian? You should be a Christian because the Bible tells you this stuff's right. But there's a lot of evidence outside of the Bible, too, that you should be a Christian. 
So Paul says it. He says, if we don't have Christ rising from the dead, he pretty much says, our faith is useless. We're wasting our time. You can also read that and deduce, if he did rise from the dead, though, this is the most important thing that we can ever do. This is the most important thing we can ever give our lives to. I don't have it on the board, because I want you guys to just think about this. I, I want to read John 20, 24 through 28, and, and, and just listen to this, this set of verses. This is just after Jesus raises from the dead. <clears throat> it says, Now Thomas, also known as Dynamis, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord, but he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands, and put my finger where the nails were, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Through the, though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Think about what Thomas, what's going on here. Thomas said, I'm not believing it unless I see it. You guys say he rose from the dead. I've been friends with you forever. Thomas was a disciple of Christ. All these things. I'm not believing it unless I see it with my hands and my fingers. Put my fingers on the side. When he was confronted with evidence, he said, my Lord and my God. This was a lot to take in. I, I understand that. And again, if you have questions, please reach out. You know, D Doug can help as well. I know there's good men and good women in this church who can help. But you've been presented with evidence that this stuff is true and reliable. There is so much more evidence outside of Scripture that God is real. With the evidence presented to you, evaluate your life. Are you living for your own pleasures? Are you living for your own desires? Are you living just to do what you want, to have fun and enjoy your day, and, and hopefully people just leave you alone? Are you living for yourself, or are you living for something else? With all of this evidence in front of you, and I encourage people, if you have doubts or your questions or you don't think this is on, honest or whatever, ask. That's what evangelism is about, is telling people the truth and then defending that truth. But with all of this evidence and the evidence outside of this, you're faced with a decision now. You can choose to continue living in sin and doing whatever you want and, you know, maybe saying, oh, I, you know, I like God, but I'm not going to live for him. Or you can look at the evidence and go, my Lord and my God. My Lord and my God. He's not saying, I think he's there. He's saying, I think he's there, and he's my Lord. He commands my steps. He teaches me where to go. He teaches me what to say, how to act, how to think, what to do. All of these different things. Your whole life is centered around Christ if you're doing it right. Everything from what you eat, the way you wake up, the way you treat your friends and your spouse and your kids, the way you read, the way you talk, the way you teach, everything. The evidence is just to get you to what you should be doing for the rest of your life. That's why God gives us evidence. I like, I think it was Immanuel Kant, uh, an old writer. He said this. He said, and I agree with him. You can have different opinions. That's okay. He said he thinks that God has given just enough evidence that if you're genuinely looking for him, you'll find him. But not enough to where everybody gets him and they don't have to try. God wants you to have a relationship with him. And that takes effort. That takes desire. You must want to know who he is. You can't just wake up and go, oh, I want to be saved, thanks God, and then live the rest of your life. Read the whole Bible. We've established it's reliable. It teaches you that is not how you're supposed to live. It teaches you that there is a radical change in your life. You're saved by God through faith. We'll get into that in just a sec, and I'm almost done. We'll get into that in just a sec. And then you change. If you're already a Christian, read this reliable text and be a better Christian for God's sake. Not for our sake, for Him, for His glory. He doesn't need you to do it. 
He wants you to do it. And he loved you enough to die on a cross. Do it for him. If you're not a Christian, think about what we've talked about. The evidence is here. And if you have doubts for either side, ask. Talk about them. Doubts are okay and normal. Don't let one doubt about one thing ruin your entire faith. Ask. I'm going to read these next two verses, and especially if you're not a Christian, but Christians, listen to this too. I hope God's convicted you. I'm going to read these next verses, and this is how the God, this is the gospel in, in, a, in just a short way. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not from yourselves. It is a gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. And then John 3.16 in English. For God so loved the world that he gave his own and only son. So whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. We're going to close out. That's the gospel. God's given us this reliable text. He's done so much for us. He died on the cross for us. He lived, he came down and lived a human life humbling himself for you. He's done so much for us. I'm begging you, please give your life to Christ. It is not something you do. It is something God does. And we accept it and give in to it. This is the most important thing you could ever do. There's heaven and there's hell. And this is the difference that makes it. Put your faith in Christ and let him change your life. Let's pray. Lord, I just want to come to you and uh, I just want to say thank you for giving us such a reliable text and a reliable word. And I just pray, Lord, that though a fool like me speak, that you just help people understand the, the ideas that we're trying to get across here and that your word is reliable and not only is it reliable it's true it teaches us what we need to know how we need to live how we need to think and act how we can be saved and what sends a man to hell and I just pray Lord that you convict our hearts so that we love you and live for you and that if we don't know you, that we become a part of your family, putting our true, genuine faith in you, Christ, for your glory and for our sake. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you guys can stand in an attitude of prayer. I, I know I am not the greatest of speakers, and I, I go too long, and I, I mess things up sometimes, but... I want you guys to just think about God and what Christ has done. There's a lot better speakers, and they wrote their words down. Don't listen to me. Go read the Bible. And so as we have this moment this morning to think about all of this, thank God for what he has given us. And just praise him and tell him, you want to live for him if you haven't already. He wants you to do that. We have a personal God who loves you and died for you. So as the music plays, I just want you to talk to God, praise him, and if you need to have conversations with him, have those now.
Lord, I just want to come to you and I want to say thank you for gathering us all here. I uh, thank you for just giving us your word and giving us a place to fellowship and do so freely today. And I ask God that you would just teach us all what you want us to learn. None of us here can speak on your behalf. We just speak what you've given already. And I just pray, Lord, that you would help convict hearts and turn people to Christ. We love you, and it's in your name we pray. Amen. Hey, thank you. Be seated. Um, well, I, I just want to say uh, thanks, Blake. Um, I, I realize that, that in, in, in our church and in any group, we all have different people who think differently and approach things differently. I, I love apologetics. I love defense of the faith. I love understanding you know, what I believe in why and, 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 and listening to debates, and I love those types of things. And, and this, is, this is something that's just right there. What, what I just want to make sure you understand, and I think you did a real good job of explaining, is that as people are copying things over and over and over and over from all over the place, yeah, is it possible they're going to be, they may copy a word down wrong or they may miss something or they may do something? Yes, right? But if you have thousands of these that you put together and you compare and you see 4,999 say one thing and then you see this other, it becomes real obvious that what we have is the reliable word of God. So that's what I want you to walk away with. And how many times did Blake say it? I love it. There is evidence after evidence after evidence that people may not believe that it's inspired by God, but you cannot intellectually argue that this is not a reliable document. And so uh, I appreciate, again, this was a real different service, and I'm glad that you were here and, and shared it in, in that. But our, our, this is a special book, and I hope you understand just how special it is. It's something worth doing. So we have something really special right now. Um, I like to turn the cameras off. And uh, you say, why are we doing that? We don't want any evidence of what I'm about to say. 